This is Anchored in Christ, the sermon podcast that gives you hope in the gospel as an anchor for your soul. Brought to you from Old South Presbyterian Church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. The tone of today's service, I think, matches the emotion of our country in grief right now. So we are going to be looking at Luke chapter 23, picking up again with verse 32. You will find that on page 77 of your Pew Bible. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself. In us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? Since you are under the since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would speak the word that we are dying to hear. We pray it in your name. Amen. It was three weeks ago. Jim was downstairs in the basement when he called out to me, Sarah, come here. I walked down and he, I heard a drip, 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 drip. You just don't want to hear that in your basement. It was the leaking shower pan above. And the problem, obviously, had gone undetected for a long time. For there was rotted wood. Okay, immediate action required. Go ask our nanny, Alyssa, can you just please turn off the shower and come into the bathroom? Or go online, which is what I did after that. Is that what you do? Go online? We're looking for the best, you know, contractor with most bang for the buck. Low cost, high quality, five stars in every rating. Use in order to make your decisions. Could you just, I, I, thank you. Now, who among us writes reviews? Can you just say who you do? We thank you. Thank you. Anyone? Thank you. Anybody? We appreciate that. If we evaluate, what if we use the same tool to evaluate Jesus? Based on his reviews, what would his ratings be? Does Jesus meet your expectations? What's interesting about Luke is that he wants us to evaluate. Luke's gospel is different from the others in that in this trial and crucifixion of Jesus, 
He keeps having the people give the title. He is king of the Jews, Messiah, Jews, Messiah, God's chosen one. Titles repeated over and over. So Jesus' person is the issue we are to look at. Is he who he claimed to be? Luke wants us to decide. In order to do this, we will review the situation and then ask who meets our expectations in this crucifixion. And I would ask that we observe what Jesus does. Okay, let's review the situation. Now, most cannot remember this, but a few can. In the 1950s, Walter Cronkite, CBS anchorman, hosted a series called You Were There. Um, have you seen the, the reviews, maybe? Okay, the reviews, maybe? Okay, I, I did. <laughs> you were there. It is when you go back in history and Cronkite takes you to the scene. You are there at Jesus' trial and crucifixion while praying. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is arrested. His hands are bound, and he's led to the home of Caiaphas, who's the high priest in Jerusalem. Jesus is placed on trial with a hastily assembled quorum of religious leaders known as Pharisees. Now, before the high priest, Jesus is blindfolded, he's mocked and spat upon, and beaten. Archaeologists have excavated this home. And if you go to Jerusalem, you can go to Caiaphas' home. You will see there that leads down into a dark dungeon. It's understood that in the night, after this interrogation and beating, they lowered Jesus into this dungeon. It was the last place of his final hours alone on earth. At daybreak, he's lifted up, and now the whole assembly of the religious leaders put him on trial. They find him guilty of blasphemy. Blasphemy. That's not a word that we say that often. We say maybe slander. Blasphemy is slander, and that is when you injure someone's good name. I heard there was a sharp-tongued U.S. senator who got fed up, got fed up mid-session and blurted out, half of this session is made up of cowards and corrupt politicians. Now, the other senators took offense and believed that that was slander they insisted that he withdraw his statement. He thought about it, and he said, I withdraw my statement. Half of this Senate is not made up of cowards and corrupt politicians. <laughs> now, Caiaphas and the Pharisees accuse Jesus of slandering. Not them, but God. They believe Jesus slanders God in his claim to be the Messiah, the anointed one, the one promised ever since Moses. He raised the dead. He fed thousands with a handful of food. He offered hope to the oppressed. But more than this, Jesus was unlike anyone else who's walked this earth. His relationship with God was real, effortless, and transparent. But Jesus had no credentials. He had no human authorization. He hung out with questionable people. He challenged the religious leaders in their defense of tradition over Scripture. The Jewish leaders determined, Jesus has to go. They bring him bound to... Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, 
and they make up blatant lies about him. Pilate examined Jesus and found him not guilty of any of their accusations. Guilty of any of their accusations. He sent Jesus to Herod, another Roman ruler, for examination. Herod examined Jesus, also pronounced him innocent, and returned him to Pilate. Notice, two secular rulers in the highest courts find that Jesus is innocent. And then all madness breaks out. Jesus is condemned. He's tortured with 39 floggings with a a whip that's got metal embedded in it. He's hung on a cross to die between two criminals. What happened? The late Morton Kelsey, a priest and counselor, wrote, Scratch the surface of a person, and below you find a beast, or worse than a beast, worse than a beast. This is what the cross says. We don't like to believe this, but let's look at the facts, Kelsey says. Who were the ones who ran the concentration camps of Nazi Germany, kept the gas ovens fed, Who performed the mass murders and executions? It's important to remember that Germany was the most literate and educated nation in the world. We think that people who do these things must have been perverted, monsters. Actually, most of them were peaceful. German citizens who had never hurt a person, living quietly and peacefully in their comfortable homes. Now let's get to our next portion. We need to ask, who does meet our expectations in Jesus' crucifixion? Let's begin with Pilate. He's in charge of administering justice. In the Roman history books, Pilate is known to be a capable administrator with a typical Roman understanding of fair play. Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus, but he did want to satisfy the crowd. He lacked the courage to stand against the crowd for what was right. He sacrificed Jesus, therefore, for political expediency. The ruler in charge of justice fails to defend. The ruler in charge of justice fails to defend the innocent. Does Pilate meet your expectations? Caiaphas, the high priest the highest representative of God to people and people to God. Priest in Latin is pontifex, which is bridge. He's to bridge the gap that we all feel. Caiaphas held the supreme spiritual position, being much like the Pope for the Roman Catholics. So why did the high priest hate Jesus so? Was it for holy reasons? Or was it out of envy? John Stott reminds us that no one is ever envious of another who is not first proud. Envy is the flip side. Envy is the flip side of the coin called vanity. Envy seeks to destroy. God's ordained representative seeks to destroy. Does Caiaphas meet your expectations? The crowd, the common people, people like you and me. These are the recipients of Jesus' healings, of his feeding, of his teaching by, in the temple day by day. But in this politically charged environment, these are the ones who are shouting in unison a chant Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate replies, 
Why? What evil has he done? The crowd gives no reason. They're whipped up. They're whipped up by emotion. Does the crowd meet your expectation of treatment toward an innocent man? What about the soldiers? We find that they're the last ones to join in the mocking of Jesus. No longer are they just following military orders. They do as they see their leaders doing. Because mocking is catchy. Does your expectation of the soldiers get met in the fair treatment of a political prisoner? Jesus was crucified between two criminals. The first one speaks. He's listened to the hate of the high priest, the religious leaders, the crowd, the mocking of the soldiers. And now that is used. He just keeps at it the whole time. If you ever think about Jesus on a cross, think about the devil in your ear mocking you. You're no Messiah. If you were you'd get down and you'd bring us with you. Now, I don't know if that resonates with you. A guilty man is cursing an innocent man. Is this what you expect from the mouth of someone nearing death? What we expect in people we fail to find. What we find is cowardice, envy, impatience, mocking, cynicism. These are vices we all share. Vices that crucified Jesus. Jesus is crucified for being who he is. This is what sin does. Now let's observe. What does Jesus do? What we see is that Jesus retains control. He is the one who keeps his head when everyone else is losing theirs. He stands out to us because he is in control. Jesus' crime was spelled out on a plaque above his head. His crime? The king of the Jews. Jesus used his kingly power and control not for himself but for those who failed him, people like us. What else do we observe? Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are, do not know what they are doing. Who are they? Who are they? Is it not those involved in his crucifixion? The ones we've named, both Jews and Romans, though all have failed, Jesus does not. Brennan Manning tells a story of an old man having his morning meditation under a tree by a river. Finishing his prayers, he sees a scorpion floating helplessly by. The man reaches out to rescue the creature, but the scorpion stings him. A minute later, he tries again to save the scorpion and is stung a second time. His hand is swollen and bloody and his face is contorted with pain. But still, he reaches out. He reaches out. A passerby sees this and shouts out, Hey, stupid old man, what's wrong with you? Only a fool would risk his life for an ugly, evil creature. The old man replied, My friend, just because it's the scorpion's nature to sting, that does not change my nature to save. Though all have failed, Jesus does not. So here's the gospel. You and I are more sinful than we dare to believe. And you and I are more loved than we have dared to hope. 
The other thing we observe, Jesus saves. It's in Standing at the foot of the cross taunt him. He saved others. Let him save himself. Don't they see? That's precisely what he's doing. Jesus died our death that we might have his life. Think of it this way. If you take a piece of paper and put it into a magazine and light it up with fire, what happens to the paper? It goes up with the magazine. Their history is the same. It's the same with anyone who is in Christ. What happens to Christ happens to the one who believes in him. He died in our place. He rose that we might live. His history becomes ours. Finally, we cross that Jesus gives life. The second criminal turned to Jesus. He's the only one who addresses him by his name, Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, we find paradise mentioned the first chapters of Genesis. Paradise is mentioned in the last chapters of Revelation. It is the place where, where God lives and what God wants is done. It is heaven and earth together again. Jesus says, today, you will be with me in, par you will be with me in paradise. He is life. Friends, Jesus may not meet our expectations. I think he offers more than our expectations. In closing, the movie Dead Man Walking was based on the true story of Sister Helen. It was her mission to care for the souls of death row inmates. And hers, in particular, was Matthew Poncelet. And in an emotional scene at the climax of the movie, Poncelet finally admits his guilt to Sister Helen. Poncelet recalls, My mama kept telling me, It wasn't you, Matt. It wasn't you. Your mama loves you. Your mama loves you. Matt responds, Sister Helen. Grieved by his guilt, Poncelet lapses into a flood of tears. Sister Helen probes him further. Poncelet forthrightly confesses to killing a boy and raping and murdering a girl. Do you take responsibility for their deaths? probes Sister Helen. Poncelet responds, Yes, ma'am. When the lights dim at night, I kneel down by my bunk and I pray for those kids. I've never done that before. Sister Helen comforts Poncelet, saying, There is a place of sorrow only God can touch. You did a terrible thing, Matt. Matt, a terrible thing. But you have dignity now. Nobody can take that away from you. You are a son of God, Matthew Poncelet. Sobbing deeply, Poncelet says, Nobody ever called me no son of God before. They called me a son of you know what lots of times, but never no son of God. It about figures. I would have to die to find love. Thank you for loving me. Jesus said, today, you will be with me in paradise. Does he meet your expectations? You decide.
Thank you for listening to this sermon from Old South Presbyterian Church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. If you'd like more information about our historic church, or you'd like to find out more about the gospel of Jesus, please visit our website at oldsouthnbpt.org. The peace of Christ be with you.